music is a listening to music or playing music like we did today for a start it's a beautiful way to tune our instrument our body mind music is very close to meditation unfortunately in our times music has been downgraded mostly to something that is happening in the background the radio while we work or cook or talk Our minds often are so used that music is something that is running in the background that it doesn't really appreciate fully the beauty and the possibility of music as a gate into our hearts, into the depths of our being. When we were young, we all may remember how music touched us deeply. And it can still do the same. One thing I, I sometimes recommend is to listen to music, not with the ears, but with the whole body at once. If we listen with the whole body to music or to anything, like the waves at the beach or someone talking to us, if we listen in this way, we overcome this idea that there is someone listening here between our ears. And that the ears are listening. I think I won't say much more for now. Maybe try it and then we'll talk about it again. I don't want to spoil the party. listening with our whole body. So the whole body becomes like a, like a sponge taken in the vibration. And in the same way, we may listen to satsang.
in music as in satsang, as in everything. There is the danger always There, the habit, the old habit of the mind to downgrade our experience, the magical experience, the new, fresh, always fresh in the now emergent experience out of the source, out of consciousness. There is always a danger that the mind, by seemingly knowing what it is, by labeling it and putting it in a box, there is a danger to miss out on the beauty, on the magic, on the silence, the wisdom behind the music, behind the words in satsang. I still have a bit myself ambivalent feelings with satsang, to be honest. Because there is a great danger in making something out of these words. The mind grabs them and it's like, ah, yeah, this is how it is. Ah, yeah, I know. Now I know. Reality is like this and not like that. Hmm. I am this and I am not that. Chapter closed. What's next? So I would like to use this opportunity to remind us that understanding, as we use it here, is not a thought. Understanding is not happening in the mind. True understanding is just a remembering in myself, in consciousness, consciousness stopping for for one part of the big picture to pretend to have forgotten the truth, revealing to itself, stopping playing hide and seek with itself, and remembering, recognizing in itself, in silence, the truth. And then usually comes the afterthought. Now I understand. But that's the commentary of what was actually happening. Or, mm, this music is so beautiful. It's beautiful to express that we understand or that something is beautiful. Nothing wrong with that. Just there is a tendency 
in the mind once we seen or heard something for a few times that it puts it in this box like Aya. Ah, yeah. This is that, Aya, ah, yeah. okay. And we don't see the beauty of every moment. We don't hear, we don't feel, we don't touch, we don't taste life in its potential of being always magic, always filled with this presence, this perfume from the source. So in satsang, it's very helpful to listen like I've never listened to any satsang before, to forget everything that we have understood, everything that we have learned, to, to take in the words like a, like a sponge taking in the drizzling rain to be open and receptive as a whole and to not downgrade the words into mental concepts only. Of course, every word spoken is a concept. But the question if, is if it is only downgraded, cut off from its, from its depths. It's infinite depths. When the words come from the depths, they, they carry the depths, the wisdom, the love, the beauty of ourselves. And, and the words carry this depths. But we only receive the depths, so to speak, if we don't cut off the words from its depths by intellectualizing and, and taking the words, the concepts for the truth. Because they never are. We have all these traditions, all these beautiful teachings and teachers and they they so often speak the exact opposite in words and still they speak about the same thing the same nothing
forever. If there is possibly a conflict in our minds, opposing concepts that seem not to match, opposing confusing ideas that seem to be a paradox. Opposing ideas that have the power to create ripples of doubts. To the teaching, to the truth, to how reality is. If there are doubts, it's very important to clear them in understanding. This can happen through the silence that is running through satsang, that is running through our lives. When we get quiet and we may find the answer to those doubts too. May find understanding in the silence of our hearts. Or it may come to us in a book. At the right time, the right sentence in a book appears. or it may come to us through a so-called teacher teaching. And we take, can take advantage if we resonate with the teaching and the teacher, so to speak, to clear those doubts directly by asking questions. Satsang understanding is like a, like a big puzzle. It's very rare to grasp, to see the whole picture from the start. There are many seemingly contradicting statements, especially in non-dual teachings. And the mind might just want to have a quick answer, a quick like, okay, how is it? Is it like this or is it like that? Tell me now, what's, what is it? But for the whole picture to appear and to become clear, to 
win this game of hide and seek that we're playing with ourselves as consciousness, in most cases, patience, endurance, almost I would say passion for the truth, for the revealing of the whole picture is required. In our hearts, intuitively, in silence, we may most likely already know many aspects of the whole picture. And sometimes in silence we receive like a huge wave of understanding. Maybe tears flow, something, something landed. It's like, wow, I can feel. And it may take years. Many years to be able to even partly, if ever, being able to articulate, to communicate that understanding that came to us in silence. There are very many wise men and women sages that never spoke about any of this And still they carried in their hearts quietly. The deep knowing of themselves of reality, of being, because knowing ourselves is being ourselves. Knowing and being are one. Ever 
even the silent knowing of being contains the whole truth. I think it's the main reason why we're meeting here, why this is happening, why this, why I share words communicating the uncommunicable, to share truth, to share understanding is one way of celebrating life. We are here not in this plan that dismisses words and thoughts as something other. Than the truth. We, we can see or wish to see at least that words and thoughts, eventually at least, do not have the power to conceal the truth. And when they lose the power to conceal the truth, they become a celebrating force of the truth. It's like music can transport the beauty bearing understanding is another way to celebrate the quality, the joy of ourselves. We all know these moments like, ah, oh, yeah, I understand. Or, oh, yes, now you understand me. It's like, oh, this is beautiful. It's like, ah, because this is a meeting in our shared being, those moments, not the commentary, but the moments where we feel it's like, oh, yes, you understand me. I understand you, it's a great joy in understanding. And very often words, concepts that used to have the power to conceal the magic of silence. Become this instrument, this tool of celebrating life. What is important is that we don't allow the old habit of the conditioned mind to fragment our experience. 
to fragment it, for example, into just a concept, just a label. Where we don't allow it to confuse the vast totality of our experience to be downgraded into one little blip of our experience. Like the thought that claims to be the truth. So, how do we not allow that? We may wonder. It seems to be for many of us, it seems to be not our experience that consciousness, awareness, is the experience. The conditioned mind is a great pretender faking that I, separate self, am listening that I, the person, am thinking, that my eyes are seeing, that my ears are hearing, that my senses are feeling, touching. But in reality, only consciousness can listen to these words right now. Only consciousness sees, hears, feels. In reality, there is only consciousness. How could something else or someone else be experiencing what is happening. There is a famous Sloka in the Kena Upanishad, referring to this. I'll paraphrase what, what I remember, might be not 100% correct.
it is not what the ears hear, but that by which the ears can hear that we here adore as Brahman, the one eternal. It is not that which the eyes see, but that by which the eyes can see that we here adore as the eternal Brahman. It is not what the mind thinks, but that by which the mind can think that we here adore as Brahman. There is two ways to interpret this famous, famous sloka. Usually it is used in the teachings to point the difference between that which perceives and that which is perceived. Awareness and the objects in awareness. I am that which is aware and the objects are something else, neti neti process called very often. I am not this, I am not that, I am not this, I am not that. I am that awareness which is aware of what I see, of what I hear, of what I perceive. And there is a deep truth in that. But there is another way, or not another, and a deeper way to interpret this sloka. Because in the first interpretation, there is still duality. There is someone, awareness in that case, or consciousness, that is real. And there are the things that are not real, the objects that are perceived. And only the perceiver is real. But we, we haven't dissolved the subtle duality yet in this way of seeing, of understanding experience. And then Maharaji, Nemkaroli Baba and others must have been wrong when they say it's all one. So to come into the seeing of that it's truly all one, and I feel that's what this sloka was pointing to.
just to see. the totality of our experience, the wholeness of our experience as it really is, always, does not know this separation, even that subtle duality. Not our ears are hearing, but consciousness is hearing, awareing, experiencing. There are no ears in reality. Ears is a form of awareing of consciousness. It is consciousness that is hearing. It is consciousness that is seeing. It is consciousness that is thinking. Last week, I think we spoke about Satchitananda briefly, being Consciousness, contentment, peace, bliss. Another way to see consciousness is to look, to hear, to see, to feel from the perspective of the totality of our experience. Not from a fragment, a fragment, separate person. Not from a fragmented mind. But to be aware of music, of thought, of words, of feelings, of the heat, the sensations, everything at once. To see that the true experiencer, the true experience of life is this totality that in reality there are no fragments, no parts. Sometimes Brahman reality, our self is referred to as the eternal witness. Just observing the playing. But if we dive deep down into our, not how we think it is, but really allow thinking, feeling, perceiving, allow the totality of our experience to arise and dissolve in our consciousness, we may see that it's not just a witnessing consciousness. It's a experiencing consciousness. It's a awareing, a knowing consciousness. It's 
witnessing, experiencing, knowing, or witnessing, experiencing, awareing, always in the same time. It knows, it is aware, it sees, and it experiences. Of course, it doesn't experience like the human faculties through the filters of thought or the senses, but in the final depths of understanding, we see that the senses, the mind, like in this Upanishad, are made of consciousness, are consciousness. There is no duality in reality, it's imagined. like this very famous Buddhist sutra. Form is emptiness, and emptiness is form. This is a very powerful pointer to the final collapse of duality. We are a bit in the middle of a jungle here. There's a lot going on around us. But we won't allow it to disturb us. It cannot disturb us because consciousness is everything that we are experiencing. It's experiencing only itself. Or love only sees love is another way to put it. So what would disturb us? Only ourselves. This is what we're speaking about today. Yes, in non-dual teachings, the distinction between the perceiver and the perceived is very important. Don't get me wrong. In the early stages of our understanding, we have to see clearly that awareness and the so-called objects or let me put it another way the, the, the awareness in the objects in the world is so well mishmashed and hidden that we kind of have to extract in non-dual teachings it's a teaching to extract that awareness, that consciousness from the things.
we become aware of the screen on which the movie plays. And whenever the movie, the play on the screen has the power to disturb us, whenever it makes me contract back into a apparent separate person, we remember that we are that screening awareness in the background and come back to that through self-inquiry. Who am I? Who or what is aware of my experience? Who or what is disturbed? Who or what is defending, reacting, justifying its position. Over and over we remind ourselves that we are this loving awareness. that is aware of the objects on the screen of consciousness. Yes. But we can see that there is still a remaining duality, a remaining separation. And we may even come to that point where the, we don't need to question anymore. Self-inquiry is just like a gesture, like a short moment of remembering. We don't need to use a pathway anymore to come back to ourself. We have established maybe i used to call that the the seventh sense like oh and we rest in that peace of consciousness but usually there is still someone resting in that peace someone tuning in into the seven sense, someone aware of the seven sense, there is still a remaining subtle duality of the perceiver and the perceived. I am aware of this presence of this peace. So there is still two. Possibly. Like there is still two and there is an awareness that is real and a world that is unreal. And the method, so to speak, the abiding as the self, as Ramana Maharshi called it, or, or resting in being, I call that sometimes. Over and over and over again, when I lose myself 
in the objects of experience, thoughts, feelings, sense perceptions, images. Over and over coming back to myself, so to speak, resting as myself, in myself. is a very welcomed approach. And it works. Because if I'm truly resting in and as awareness while experience is emerging and dissolving in me, I re-identify with the totality. Because as there is nothing outside of this consciousness, of this awareness, without thinking, without, we might not be even aware of that, or my, the mind is not aware of that. While I'm resting in this silent, loving awareness, this presence, this perfume. Unnoticed by the mind, all is included that is happening in and around me. So I'm grinding down by abiding in and as the self. I'm kind of grinding down this old identification of a fragmented, conditioned mind. We just have to make sure that we don't confuse this recognition and this wonderful experience of the shanti, of the peace, of the presence, to confuse that this is, so to speak, All words don't really make sense here. Yeah. Ideas into your head. We can check for ourselves if I do know this loving awareness and it has revealed its peace, its beauty, its love, its contentment, its joy. Is there still someone aware of that experience? Is there still a perceiver and the perceived. And often, not always, there is still a center point at that time, a center the viewpoint of my avatar is still the center of my experience. I experience the world and myself from a point in space 
and time. But eventually, and maybe almost unnoticed until the teaching or the teacher points it out, or we notice like, hmm, we may notice something change. It's so subtle uh, that the mind cannot grasp it. We may find out like, wow, where is this? perceiver where is this witness we might have been witnessing and witnessing and witnessing for years or decades our experience and there was this perceiving witness awareness aware of the things and one day we might look around and hear and feel and and see like whoa this witness has dissolved in this loving awareness And we may not understand what's going on, what has happened, but we find ourselves as the living Upanishad. The duality of the perceiver and the perceived of the witness and the objects the duality of samsara and nirvana the duality of emptiness and form Is gone. And this eternal witness, Brahman, as it is described, that used to be just a almost external, neutral, witnessing faculty shining the light on the world and on this body-mind has merged once and for all back into the movie the screen and the movie are one again they were never separate that's the big joke we may love out we may love and love and love and love and see this whole journey was just a joke it was just a funny game the spiritual journey and we find ourselves back at start. Nothing has changed. And this witnessing consciousness, this seven sense, dissolves like everything else 
in this one consciousness and then it's not just a witnessing and aware consciousness but it's a witnessing experiencing awareing consciousness all is one humanness and consciousness are one The appearance of objects remains, of course, we still have a point of view for our avatar. We can still navigate through space and time with our human bodies that were gifted to us at that time for our enjoyment mostly. But even the appearance of things changes. The senses are freed from its bondage, so to speak. And life shines, radiates. Some may have made these kind of experiences through consciousness enhancing substances or something. The senses open and whoa, suddenly there's music there. We can, yeah. I remember my first joint. Oops. Santana with guitar. This is still a pale copy, any drugs I haven't taken many, so I cannot speak in, in absolute terms. But Ram Das told me even LSD, which I never tried, is just a pale copy to our true unfiltered, unfragmented, experiencing, witnessing, awareing, loving of the objects that are appearing in and as us. It's a felt sense. It's a that's what is meant when we say that the sages love everyone. We love everything and everyone. Not because we like everything and everyone. We can still the, distinguish the beauty of a piece of art, a painting that is shining back 
the truth, the, the, the magic, the consciousness, an artist that had pushed his soul, his understanding into a painting and it and it reveals the beauty of reality and a piece of contemporary art that is sometimes standing in our towns these days and we wonder what's this uh -huh. we can still discriminate things But the felt sense is it's all me. It's all one. So we can love everyone as Nimkaroli Baba Maharaji. as requested me. Love everyone and tell the truth. Who would we lie to if it's all us? They would be really foolish. So my Brahman, so to speak, is not a cold witnessing neutral, I have nothing to do with my creation consciousness. It's a participating, loving, caring, consciousness it loves and cares for its own play for its own creation And a powerful way to overcome this conditioning, this fragmenting, is just to tune in into the totality of my experience. To not allow my mind to grab a specific part in my experience and to cling on it, but to be aware of everything together. Sounds, thoughts, feelings, perceptions, everything is happening in me, in this totality, in consciousness. Nothing is outside of me. So there are two ways, so to speak. Either I go within into this silent center of myself where there is no objects and just a silent piece of myself. Or I come to my natural expansion, which is my nature, and I experience life from this totality it's both the same it's two different ways there are whole traditions who focus on the concentrating part i call it the dot and then there is the circle it's like our self is like a dot and a circle and there are two gateways to the infinite eternal reality 
You can enter through the dot, through focusing and entering deep within, or through expansion, like many tantric and yogic and Sufi practices practice through this expansion. And we come to this outer ring, so to speak, and, and we enter the same open spaciousness. The dot and the circle are one, not two. So many ways, all the same. No matter which pathway, so to speak, in the end, We have to see that nothing is excluded. It's an all-inclusive Brahman, an all-inclusive self. We have booked an all-inclusive human experience when we book this trip, this holiday. It's all here for our soul's wish to experience all the aspects of this drama, of this play. Shankaracharya, the great sage that brought Advaita Vedanta into the world, really, who has written a lot of great texts that is referred to in this tradition. And often these words are put into Ramana's mouth. He was referring to Shankaracharya. The world is an illusion. Only Brahman is real. The world is Brahman. The last part of the equation is somehow often dismissed or forgotten in non-dual teachings. Another way to see it is an old Zen saying that I like. In the beginning, in our experience, rivers are rivers and mountains are mountains. And then rivers are no more rivers and no more mountains. until rivers are rivers again and mountains are mountains again. First, we see the world as things, objects separate from me, a world outside of me, a subject-object relationship to the objects of my experience, the mountains, the rivers are mountains and rivers, and I am a person. Until I can see, oh wait, no, these mountains and rivers are not real, only Brahman, only consciousness, only reality is real. There are no things. 
There are no objects outside of consciousness with their own reality separate from consciousness. And we may retreat for 10 years, like, ah, the world, I'm done with it. I just stay as that and rest in and as that. And eventually, I may come out of my cave and look and, oh, the rivers are rivers again and the mountains are mountains again. But now they're shining with its reality, with its beauty to be made out of the same stuff that I'm made of. Um, the world is Brahman. And we may choose to jump into that river and cool down and enjoy all the beauty of our human experience in a totally new way. The way it was meant to be. And we are that one that is experiencing, witnessing, awareing through all of these beautiful forms. Through all of these different avatars. Form is emptiness, and emptiness is form. <laughs> 